Greetings and welcome to Revna Den. I'm Michael Hassenfang, and this is episode 7, Monster Mashing, Possession, and Oppression. I feel that this is my uh, most interesting episode topic. That's my favorite because it's what the whole Revna Den, even the logo with Ephesians 612 sort of revolves around, which is spiritual warfare. And I got some interesting tales to tell on this one. Um... Not so much uh, explaining into the Bible verses which go into the spiritual warfare because most of these are just going to be tales of me explaining my past and how I actually became a Christian because of this spiritual warfare and the stuff that I deal with even up until today. Signs and things to look out for if you're also going into any sort of spiritual battles, fighting off any territorial principalities or you know if there's anything like a possession a friend in your life that's you know oppressed as well i think we'll be covering a few segments here and i'm not even sure where to begin with this and i feel it's probably going to be my longest episode maybe maybe not but i kind of have this like feeling that i'm going to be going on for quite a while and it's why i started the side notes as well too like uh, a couple days ago with that prelude to episode seven because of the dream the spiritual warfare dream that i had and i also noticed today um if some of you haven't caught it right at the end the end segment of that episode when i started to give the end prayer that i was giving uh the sound was cut off there was there was no uh volume or like sound at all and i have to go back and check my clip to make sure see because i didn't turn off the sound i mean i kept the sound running as normal but it for some reason got removed and i'll check and see if there's anything there if i'm able to on places like odyssey and rumble maybe youtube be able to repost that video you know just use the same post but revamp like re-upload the clip if the sounds there then i will but um yeah it's even that may be signs of spiritual warfare just the stuff that i'm trying to get into uh, at the end when i'm giving out prayers and uh decrees of certain people it's the sound was completely off that was weird so and i've always been into uh spiritual warfare <laughs> But for me, I think it was because of my upbringing that I had as a kid. It was more of a more of a physical, carnal spiritual warfare. I, I think in what C.S. Lewis says as dualism, as the manly, you know, the manly religion, a dark fighting light, but like the physicality of it, uh, as opposed to the spiritual nature, was something I was always more into. Stuff like the Hammer Horror films. I, I grew up loving watching werewolf and vampire movies not so much because of the evil that was in it but because of the triumphant uh people within the film you know like van helsing as peter cushing all these other people that are coming in and stopping the monsters and good overcoming evil and it was this very uh spiritual it was demonic but it was also like the physical flesh reality of it that if there was such a thing as vampires and worlds i'd be all about it and wanting to stop and you know fight that particular battle um but spiritual warfare seems to be something which is always is going to be slightly different because <laughs> you're worrying not in the flesh for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places uh that seems to be sort of the battle that we're being imposed upon there's a flash of light there for a sec anyways um yeah, my story was that of a child being raised watching these films and always being impressed with those type of stories. Uh, I also grew up in a town which was very... Uh, let, me, let me backtrack that a bit. I grew up in a place called Barnes, Wisconsin, but 30 miles from there is a town called Hayward, which I ended up living in in my teenage years. And ever since then, my mom has been in that town. That town was pretty spooky. A lot of spiritual stuff going on there. Um, there's been like three satanic cults in the last 40 years, or maybe four satanic cults in the last 30 years. I can't remember which one it is, but it's a lot of spiritual activity, a lot of uh, ghosts, which, I don't think ghosts really are ghosts. I think they're demonic entities, but um, a lot of supernatural activity going into that town. 
and it's where my uh, starting phase for Christianity really began. I was raised Catholic, um, but then kind of had a falling out in my teenage years and stuff, uh, studying different things, getting even into the dark arts myself. I'll probably explain that a little bit more as well. It's probably why there was so much oppression in that town and in my house as well. When getting into these spiritual activities, the dark arts stuff, I was big into tarot, I was big into Reiki, um, crystals, you know, the whole new age thing, you know, totem and animal spirits and stuff like that. Um, and it got to the point that I was doing tarot and understanding it so much that I would be able to do the spread and understand what the question was that they were asking without them even asking it. In fact, I, I would specifically tell them, don't relay to me what the question is. I will read it and I will decipher it to you. And it got to the point where I was starting to see visions in my heads of what they were asking. And it was usually spot on. Like they knew exactly the situation. I'm sorry. I knew exactly the situation that they were having and they were pretty much confirming it. Um, I also had a friend named Jeremiah who uh, was kind of into spiritualism and a bit of the dark arts as well too it got to the point that well I, I think it was i think it was a family generational curse with him because it started i believe with his grandparents or farther back but he would be able to when walking down the street with him he'd be able to point where the lightning was going to strike next you know there it'd go off and he'd go there and it'd go off and he'd go there and it'd go off um, I remember even playing uh, LARPing with him uh, doing Vampire the Masquerade uh, and the person doing the game um, was starting to get really irked at him because in that game, at least with the one we were doing with LARPing and Vampire, it was it was a paper, rock, scissors, you know, to win the role. And this guy could not beat Jeremiah's like it, he, he would get the right answer every time and like beat him. Always. It took him like 20 times before it finally, like, <clears throat> before he finally won one round. He kept using all his skills and, and stuff like that, which he said he was cheating in the end because he couldn't, he had to get past his action, but Jeremiah just kept beating him. Like, like he knew exactly everything that, you know, was, was going to be called. Um, he was the first person that I banished a demon out of, one called Came or Cayman. He goes by two different names, but it's supposed to be a demonic mimicking bird. And we were visiting a friend down in Baraboo because I believe we were trying to move to Madison. And so we stayed at a friend's house and he was telling me all these stories and dreams about black ravens coming to him in his, well, in his nightmares, I guess it wouldn't be dreams, but they, they, they'd be coming to him and, you know, Cain would be there as like the mimicking bird and, you know, trying to claim possession over him and stuff. Um, and he believes that it was from uh, generational curses from his family where his grandparents or great grandparents were uh, into that sort of activity. And so while there, I tried to do a banishment from the oppression he was getting because at the time, I don't think he was really possessed until I started praying for him. And then that's when the demon decided to come into him. It's the first time that I've actually seen it where the demon spoke out through Jeremiah and um, I think back then I may have failed more in it because I had more of this Gnostic or even like a Catholic understanding of exorcisms so I was doing like praying the Hail Mary uh, and speaking that angels would come and bind the demon up and take him before the Lord to do with him as he wills which I, I suppose would be something I'd still say today uh, when casting out demons, but I just, I had more of a mindset that I don't think was totally as Christian as it is today. And I feel that even though I may have spooked out the demon uh, for that particular time, the Bible even says, if you don't, you know, if, if you clean the house and the house is still emptied, that demon is going to come back and bring seven more with him who are stronger than he is and reoccupy the house. And people always say, can Christians be possessed? And that was always a topic that I, 
I, I personally would say no, because if you are a true Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. The house is not it, the house is not empty. It's it's not cleaned out and you know vacant for anyone to come in. The Holy Spirit resides within you. So I think the question is <clears throat> not can Christians be possessed, but can true Christians be possessed? Once that actually accepted the Holy Spirit and allowed Jesus or the Holy Spirit to come and live within you. There's plenty of Christians out there, I feel, that may have not done that, or church-going people that say they may believe in Jesus, but never accepted him as Lord and Savior, never allowed him or the Holy Spirit to come and indwell within them. And so this is why we see a lot of controversy between will Christians be possessed or, you know, can they not be possessed because of the Holy Spirit? Well, I think the answer is both. I, I think if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling within you and that you've allowed him to reside within you and give your life up to Christ, then no, demons can't possess a Christian. But there's plenty of Christians out there who I think can be possessed and uh, you know can be taken over by these entities that will reside within them. And when I exercised Jeremiah, um, I made the mistake because I wasn't at that time, I feel, a, a true Christian. And then you know, uh, minister to him and evangelize to him and let him uh, have Christ come into him, you know, accept Christ as his Lord and Savior and have the Holy Spirit indwell within him. So it was kind of just kicking the demon out, only to have him come back later. And I think, I think it probably got worse for Jeremiah after that. Now, I haven't spoken to him in many years. It could be he came to Christ. It could be something else i don't know but that was pretty much my first experience and i feel that i may have did it wrong the second time that it happened to me i did two exorcisms at one time and i had two friends over and we were drinking because we were dumb 20 year olds um uh, not to say i don't drink i still do beer and wine but we were doing hard liquor like drinking i think it was rum i don't really touch hard alcohol anymore i'm not into that i just do beer, coffee, wine, <laughs> and uh, I think those are the indulgences that I probably drink the most. So, But it was this really cheap, disgusting rum, low budget, like $7, and we got pretty smashed, and my friend Brian at the time was talking, and he was giving me stories about dreams he had about aliens, which I also think are demonic in nature there aren't so much extraterrestrial as they are interdimensional and i think that they can bring themselves into this reality but it is a demonic entity it is not somebody from across the stars the bible says that uh, eve is the mother of all living so even though in the span of the universe we may see it as we're just a speck you know in a giant vast sea of nothingness you know, and there could be life somewhere in some other unknown galaxy, but I tend to think that the universe in and of itself is Christocentric, which means that even though we're a dot somewhere in the universe, we're the focal point of the universe that God hones in on. And everything else is just literally space. Now, it could be that there is life out on other planets. I mean, to be fair, that verse of saying Eve was the mother of all living, well, God also breathed life into every animal that had the nostrils before the breath of life. So is Eve the mother of all cows, you know, or ducks or dogs? You know, it's like, yeah, these are different kinds of animals. And it could also mean that Eve is the mother of all living here on Earth. Now, she, obviously, she wouldn't be the mother of all living at some other planet somewhere else that we haven't discovered yet. So could there be other humans somewhere else in, you know, the in the likeness of God? Maybe, but I, I highly doubt it. I think the universe is Christocentric uh, for Earth, God looking down onto this planet, which would also mean that Christ would have to go to other planets if God created everything and have him die for those people as well, too. So, I, I mean, that's, that's a stretch. Um, I was always under the impression that it was one and done. So, anyways, went off on a little tangent there. Uh, humans on other planets and aliens and demons. But anyways, he was talking about aliens and stuff and how he had a dream that they were coming for his sisters and stuff. Um, 
Sorry for the pause there. I had to get them from Stop Yelling. I think this is going to be a very, very, very choppy film because I'm getting constant opposition. People clanging loud noises out there, people yelling, people bouncing around, walls banging. As I'm trying to record this, it seems that they're just trying to get every sort of distraction they could possibly throw at me today to not talk about spiritual warfare, which is funny because all it's doing is actually promoting and showing the fighting of spiritual warfare. So, good job. <clears throat> um, where was I? Yes, he was talking about aliens and starting to get freaked out because of the dreams that he was having and was starting to get more and more like, I could f sense that he was starting to get really, he, he was drunk, but there was something else there. He was just like mumbling and repeating himself and going into just repetition. And I'm like, what is with, he never acts like this when he's drunk. Um, and then I felt an uneasiness come on to me. It was like pressing me down and felt like it was seeping into me. And I could tell that something was trying to work its way into me. There was a spiritual entity there. So I get up and I go into my own bathroom and I, uh, I threw up in the toilet. And what's interesting and what the movies don't tell you is that it's not like the exorcist. Okay. You're not like puking pea soup. Um, it wasn't bright green or anything like that, but when I threw up, it was pitch black, like oil, like sludgy oil vomit that was coming up out of me. Um, and I don't care how horrible rum is, it's not going to turn your vomit black. So I threw up and that's when I knew something was trying to possess me. So... I had a little bit more gumption then to cast it out in the name of Jesus and, you know, be, be covered by his blood and be covered by Christ and saying that you don't have control over me. Christ owns me. And it, it went, it like instantly went out of me. Still felt a little sick and stuff like that, but I could tell that it was gone. I walked back out into my bedroom and both Joe and Brian, Joe who was passed out previously, is now wide awake. And he's got, his hands were like this, but they were down by his sides. And he was just kind of just staring at Brian, who was on the bed now. And Joe growls at him, this guttural kind of canine growl. And Brian hisses back at him like a feline, just really loud and stuff. And so I could tell that these guys weren't, I mean, this wasn't some inside joke. I just wrote black stuff. So I don't think no matter how much you're trying to pull off a joke, it's not going to make me throw up black stuff. <laughs> so, um, and so I, uh, I'm not too sure why I did this, but, um, Brian lays back down on the bed and Joe is just still standing there in that pose. And so I, I wanted to test the spirits per se. Um, I wanted to say, hey, Brian, look who's who's standing right next to me, which was Joe. And I'm like, who's, you know, it's, it's Joe. You see him here? And, you know, Brian's just like, Joe is not here. And that's when I knew that it was pretty much something was up. So I started praying. I, I didn't, I didn't um, intentionally say it out loud. Um, I was... I was saying it under my breath to test the spirits again because Brian went back, you know, laying down on the bed and his eyes were closed. So I pretty much said in the name of Jesus, at the count of three, I want you to open up your eyes. One, two, three. And I said this under my breath very quietly so he couldn't hear. And as I said three, he opened his eyes and just looked at me. So those were pretty much two giveaways <laughs> that these guys were possessed. So that's when I started praying and started casting him out and stuff. Um, and Brian, was it Joe or was it Brian? I think it was Brian that threw up. I don't think Joe threw up. He went and passed out again and, uh, Brian threw up and his vomit on my floor was pitch black as well. Just oily black sludge that came out of him. And trying to remember how that ended but I think it just ended more or less with me praying and you know, getting the demons out of my house and stuff or getting them out of the body at least of Joe and Brian and it was more of a just a kind of them waking up from their sleep it wasn't a hard fighting of demons screaming and yelling and stuff like that they just sort of hissed for a while and then just left so again the same situation happened where I think they got pushed out the demons. But again, 
They didn't give their lives to Christ. I still don't think either of them have, as far as I know. And they could have returned again. <laughs> so, learning lessons on what it means to vacate the premises, and if it's not filled with someone else, they're going to come back in uh, sevenfold, and it's going to be even harder to get them out again. And I think this is kind of one of the things that a lot of people are having trouble with when it comes to Christians and them being saved. And can they be possessed? Can they, they, they can have oppression. I believe anyone can have oppression. You can constantly have demons always badgering you on a nonstop basis, but to be possessed and controlled by one as a true Christian, I don't think so. Because you do have the Holy Spirit within you. You do have Christ within you who's not going to let them in. And any battle that you have is going to be from an external fighting, not really an internal one, unless it's one where you're starting to feel convicted and you're starting to believe the lies that are being told to you from them. Which is oppression. It's not really possession. It's, it's just a constant badgering and fighting of them trying to penetrate into you. But um, if you don't give them a foothold, they won't be able to get in. And if you believe in Christ and have him as your Lord and Savior, obviously, with the Holy Spirit in you, you know, they're not coming in. So those are my two um, live action <laughs> spiritual warfare issues that I've had. So three exorcisms and two at one time. I've had a whole bunch of other stories. When we were big into the dark arts again, my brother was doing a Ouija board and contacted Zazo. For those of you who know Zazo is, yeah, yeah, we, we found out who that was before we even watched all these movies and documentaries that have been coming out recently on Zazo and the Ouija board demon. And Zazo appeared to us as a white dog on our yard the next morning because he asked, you know, he's going to show himself and Eric asked how he's going to show himself and he's like, I will come as a, as a dog, as a, a white dog and the next morning there it was sitting in our yard looking directly into our window at, at him. Um, a bunch of other manifestations, spiritual entities within our house, people seeing ghosts, uh, it's friends seeing a particular ghost two of them who didn't even know each other and they specified seeing the same apparition uh so there's no way that it could have been concocted between these two because these two didn't even know each other so and they they said the same thing um another one of my friends said the same thing about the ghost being in there and specified it perfectly uh i i've worked in businesses in hayward that had ghosts in it so a lot of a lot of demonic activity goes on in that town and this is just one town in one state you know across the nation if not the world and it shows you just how intense one place can be when it's controlled by certain principalities and powers and dominions they have you know claim to this particular um, province of their area this is why when Daniel, when praying, he went on for like 21 days before Michael arrived, you know, and he's like, what, what took you so long? And he's like, well, I was, I was fighting with the Prince of Persia. This is a actual principality. His domain was within that area and he was fighting him so he can get the answers to Daniel. And it's just like, this is, this is one demon that one angel was fighting and it's just like, no, he could have had more under him fighting Michael to, you know, then Michael got through. But what I'm saying is that that's just, that's just one principality. That is just one area of domain, which uh, shows you the spiritual battle that goes on. And I was always wondering about that too, because my, my question to God was always, I always thought it was a one and done, you know, if God is almighty and God is all powerful and God is, you know, all he has to do is snap his fingers and it's over. Why are we in constant intercession and constant battling, constant fighting and repetition of just asking for this prayer over and over and over and over and over and fighting for it? Uh, I was always under the thought that it should be just one and done. You say it and it's done, you know, because God's all powerful. There, nothing can stand up against him. You know, it's, it's an intercession going up to him. If he approves it, boom, done and over with. But that's not how it works. It's sent out through his angelic forces to relay the message or answer the prayers or give the gifts or bestow all the stuff. And there's an opposition fighting that. And they're not trying to get the gifts through. They're not trying to get the answers through. They're not trying to give the provisions through or, you know, what, what God has ordained to pass on to the people, which uh, pretty much 
is the mailman, the angelic forces, <laughs> coming through and dispensing the actions or delivering the messages. And they are in constant fight to get it through. This is why I think we need to be partakers in constantly claiming and in constantly fighting and con constantly interceding and praying for certain people. I have a friend of mine who's had ailments and is sick uh, very badly and it just comes and goes but each time it comes it's like it's progressively worse and it's just like you know i was always just sort of angered i guess i shouldn't say at god but in a sense sort of because i always thought it should be just one prayer healed done you know and i always thought that maybe my prayers weren't strong enough or i was too weak or i wasn't asking in the right way and it's it's not even that it is the spiritual opposition that is coming against your prayers because they do not want this to be achieved you're gonna get pushback it's not like these people that have these domains and have these uh, you know the principalities and powers that are subjected to a certain territory aren't just gonna give it Oh, he said a prayer. Okay, I guess we'll just go, hey, Beelzebub, let's go kick the can somewhere. He's, no, they're going to fight and be like, no, we're, we're keeping this. You're not getting through. So you're going to have opposition. You're going to have fighting. And it's a particular type of spiritual warfare that I was never into. I always, I always enjoyed going back to the original um, story that I was bringing up with C.S. Lewis, the duality, the dark and the light, and the how, how the, the, the physicality of monster mashing of like spiritual warfare always intrigued me more than this particular type of spiritual warfare because this one is just it's it's a wear down and it's it's a constant battle it's a constant fight it's something you need to constantly stand and be on guard for all the time and constant don't don't you know stop praying into what it is that you're looking for and it's just one of the things about spiritual warfare you just keep praying until you see it you keep asking until you see it and the mistakes that i have made in the past uh shows me that that one i'm i need to constantly be in spiritual warfare fighting for what it is i'm looking for but also once it has been achieved to give god thanks and if it's a person who is say oppressed or even in possession to lead them in the christ have them give up their life for him you know have christ be their lord and savior and have the holy spirit be indwelled and put into them so that they don't have seven more occupants coming in and now it's even stronger and more harder to get them out because of the original possession and um, trouble that they did have with these spirits so now that i told my story again it's going to be a long episode it's probably going to go for a full hour we've reached about the halfway mark i'm guessing I gave you that very long introduction. We're going to do communion in remembrance of what the Lord did for us. Again, when you do it in church, as a community, as the bride of Christ, it's, I mean, it's, it's always good to do it, but there are times where I, I feel I almost have to take this daily because of just the spiritual warfare that we are constantly going through or many of us who are trying to do these videos are seeing what's happening is actually going through it's been quite a ride to be honest and a lot of more internal fighting than external and i'm not saying that from a possession point but more of an oppression or more of how i see myself which is different than how christ sees us and it's been a long hard battle and i'm just this uh, and praying more and decreeing more and intercessing more and using the oils more just anything i can does help but we're entering that stage of spiritual warfare where i think we're going to need to put on that full armor soon uh, we need to start start getting into it so let's start with this Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this, uh, I was going to say short introduction. This long, long, probably putting them to sleep introduction on spiritual warfare and how we need to prep ourselves. Please give me the words to speak now from your side, not just the stories that I have, but to prep them and to get them prepared for the days ahead, which are going to be going exponentially darker before the flipping of the tables happens. And we're going to see the last harvest revival and restoration and recompense of what you are trying to do within this time, within this era. Please help us, Lord. 
because I know I do ramble a lot <laughs> and I try to stay on focus, but that's not how my mind works. I'm all over the place and to have you speak through me again would be a wonderful thing so that they can become more focused in their battles for what they need to do in your calling. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So with that introduction, where do I even begin? Um, I guess for me, I could delve a little bit more into the spiritual warfare of how I wished it was as opposed to what it is. And again, this is why I like stuff like Hammer Horror Films, because there is a physicality to that particular type of demonic warfare where you're actually slaying something physical that you can see, that you can perceive, that is there in front of you, and that you can end through whatever proper means it is, be it a silver bullet with a werewolf or a stake through the heart with a vampire. And I, I've, I've always I've always liked that. I've always found myself to be one of those people in a Hammer Horror film who, you know, wears the old stagecoat jackets, you know, and the vests, you know, and uh, the old Edwardian clothing and carrying the lantern around in a dungeon and stuff and trying to find the evil and smite it out, you know. <laughs> to, to me, that type of dark versus light was... <clears throat> always something that I enjoyed in spiritual warfare, but spiritual warfare in reality is not really that. Now, there have been people that claim there are such things as vampires and werewolves, and I'm kind of one of those people who do believe it. Um, I, I come from Wisconsin, which has the most werewolf sightings out of any state in the entire nation. I mean, many people see them all over the place, and there is a lot of Luciferian occultic activity that goes there. And I believe that there is such things, but it's such a rarity um, to come across something like that. And even if you do come across that particular type of rarity, the idea supposedly is not to kill it but to bring these people to Christ, because they were people who gave their life to Satan. These people, I mean, if they're creatures like that, they have devoted, solely devoted to satanic, you know, to, to, to the Luciferian way of life. So the rarity of you seeing one is, you know, increased by the rarity of actually turning one to Christ again. It seems like an almost improbability to find one, let alone bring one to Christ. But I believe that there is such entities out there you know we speak of uh genesis chapter 6 with the, the nephilim and the giants and from all these demonic activities of uh, the fallen angels sleeping with human beings and from there they they get the gigantes which does mean giant but it specifically means earthborn and it, they from there it's not just giants but this is where the idea of things like satyrs and stuff come from or like the you know weird creature hybrids uh from the mythological times in fact they believe that the titans which were the gods of that time were actually the nephilim because titan means shaitan in arabic and then shaitan means satan so titan actually is satan when the Titanic sunk, the Satanic sunk. I don't think a lot of people understand that. So it's kind of a little freaky when you think about it. So, um, Which is why I'll probably never go on the new Titanic if it's built again. Not just for the thought that it's sinking, but I'm literally writing the Satanic. Which probably, you know, it's not a good idea to do. Um, where was I? I'm going off on a rant again. But yeah. Uh, people like this, people like Peter Cushing over there are like sh movies and shows that I love and adore. And it's weird because I got Cushing up there, but my favorite person is, uh, R Rupert Davis, uh, playing the Monsignor Ernst Mueller from Dracula has risen from the grave. This guy to me is like the epiphany of what just, uh, awesome monster masher is he was a monsignor that comes to the small village and the people stop going to church he's like why have you stopped going to church you know oh the the shadow of the castle dracula lands on the church and this whole place is cursed and this dude's like yeah not today it's not going to happen i'm going to put this bs to bed so he goes with the priest of that village straps on a big golden cross to his back and the seeds uh, sorry proceeds to climb up this mountain brian blessed style to the castle where he slaps that golden cross on the door exercises the castle and then tells him to go back to work you know go preach to your village now get your job done 
goes home to his own village, you know, gets a snifter of wine and a cigar and puts his feet up. You know, now, to me, that's like, this is my kind of spiritual warfare guy. You know, he could get stuff done and then go home and, you know, still be the, the Monsignor and have a little snifter and a smoke. Uh, and not only that, but he brings the, <coughs> the uh, hero of the story. Well, the ending of the story was some fiance of his niece who was an atheist to Christ as well too. And he doesn't even die from Dracula. Like, I think if this guy was the main hero, he'd probably whip Dracula's butt in three seconds, but he dies because the priest from that village turns to Dracula and ends up killing him. So it was his own people that killed him and stuff like that. And I, that's almost feels kind of like what spiritual warfare is a lot of the time is that you're trying to fight off all this, all this demonic oppression and you actually pull it off and the people that are, you know, that actually belittle and, and you know stab you in the back are the ones that are your friends or part of this faith and i know i'm saying that in a generalization i know not everyone in the church is like that but it seems that the biggest opposition for us who are in spiritual warfare where our intercessors are the ones that are of faith and they just they for some reason either don't want to do spiritual warfare or don't believe it or think that's not for us or this is long ago you shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be speaking in tongues you shouldn't be praying you shouldn't be intercessing you shouldn't be declaring you shouldn't be decreeing you shouldn't be doing any of this stuff and it's just i think we're entering into a new time where this is going to become just bolder and bolder and bolder and just in your face and you're going to see it exactly for what it is and people are going to start standing up again and the people who are shaken to their core because of the darkness that's going to be coming and just jolted awake out of the slumber of this religious spirit that the church has been in for centuries if not millennia will finally snap into it and will start doing what is being you know said we, we, sh we should have been done you know we should have been doing this whole time but um, now it is a call to arms and I'm not, I'm not a type of person who thinks I'm better than anyone else because of certain revelations that were given to me. I'm just trying to blow the trumpet. I'm trying to get people to stand up and get into that call of arms. I'm not saying that people have to speak in tongues. I'm trying to give them weapons of warfare to use. If you don't want to take the hand grenade that I'm giving you into battle, then at least take something with you. But may I recommend that it's not just a pointed wooden stick and sheer gumption of just wanting to walk into it. You need to be dressed up in the armor of God. You need to use the weapons that are being given to you freely. You know, it's like you can look at this and say, oh, I don't like it. Well, there's a lot of things that I don't like when it comes to war, but I'm going to have to take it if we're going to proceed to fight this battle. And I think a lot of people just they negate or they just they throw aside all these things, all these gifts that the Holy Spirit is giving to us because they just don't believe it anymore. Or that was in times past or I'm going to look silly if I do it. It's like, well, the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of man. So look silly doing it because something tells me you'll probably win the battle a lot faster if you did. No, the fighting that we have is not based on dark versus light in the material world. There is the people of the world, the global elites and stuff like that, that are trying to take over and they're Luciferian and they worship him. But our job is to try and pray for them and try to save them as well and bring them into the kingdom because technically speaking, they're not the enemy. It's the people, people, it's the spiritual entities above these people. And they have been duped and either hijacked or bribed or blackmailed or free willed their way into this lifestyle. And their hearts are starting to be hardened and they're just not turning from it. And we should always try and bring these people in. <sighs> but they're not the enemy in the sense of the flesh where we need to go and shoot a silver bullet into them or drive a stake through their heart. You know, we, we need to try as hard as we can to bring them into Christ. And if that doesn't work, then God's going to have the final say on this. And he's going to be the one that claims the vengeance upon these people. Um... C.S. Lewis, I believe, uh, did a thing called the tertium quid in, in Latin. It's, it's known as the third option. It's the idea that you can't call a line crooked unless you have some idea of what a straight line is. And if God started the world 
as a whole and everything within that creation was all good, then darkness was not a separate entity that somehow was created and crept in to this all created all good world. Because if everything was good, where did darkness come from? And when I say darkness, I, I mean evil. I understand that God created the darkness too. He owns it all. He owns the night. He owns the moon. He, he owns the darkness. But when I say dark, I'm talking to the idea of evil. And where did that come from? It's not a separate entity. It's not like a yin and a yang. It's not a dualism attitude, which certain people believe in. C.S. Lewis said it was the man, manly religion. It's it's the yin and the yang. It's the Zoroastrian that they're, you know, you can't have dark without the light. Well, even if that's true, the darkness and the light were created, unified as one, and it was all under God, which is the tertium quid, the third option, the final, the pivotal apex of where everything comes from. In pantheism, you have all these different gods. Um, which God is right? Which God is wrong? Which God is good? Which God is evil? Who has precedence over the other gods? Where did all these other gods come from? From the tertium quid. And the same thing happens with dualism. The only way that you can have um, all goodness is through a monotheistic God. Now, the judo, the, sorry, the Judeo-Christian belief, even Muslim faith and stuff like that, believes that there was an all supreme being who created everything. Everything was all good and evil crept in by our own choices. Free will is what evil is. If you look at sin, Sin means, it's an old archery term, to miss the mark. You, there's a bullseye over here, and you shoot the bow and arrow, and you need to hit the target. But if you fall short of that target, or you miss the bullseye, it's called sinning. You've sinned, you've missed the mark. And to hit a bullseye means to hit spot on to what God has called you to be, what God's will is, what God's law is, what his ultimate decision of a particular topic is. And if you move away from that, or if you miss the target, you have sinned. Now, <clears throat> the way you sin is to not follow God's goodness. If everything was created and if everything was good, then everything needs to be based off God's goodness. But if you have your own goodness that you want to attain to, and it's not in alignment with God's goodness, that is what is considered evil. And C.S. Lewis explained it nothing more as evil is nothing but corrupted goodness. Because if you think about it, no one is ever evil just for the sake of being evil. You could be good for the sake of being good, but you can't be evil for the sake of being evil. There's always something to it that's tying you to this necessity, this need, this, this uh, action that you're taking, whether it's killing somebody or whether it's stealing from somebody or whether it's, you know, just think of anything evil. What is tied to that is your own self-fulfillment, your own self, whether it's revenge or you're just your, your own need or your own lust or your own just desires that you want to attain to regardless of what anyone else thinks or gets hurt by, including God. And when you do that, you're taking your, what you consider your goodness, your self-righteousness, your action to attain what you want for your desire, because your desire technically as how you perceive it would be good but it's a corrupted goodness. And you look at all demonic activity, you look at all what everyone here does, and it's always for something. You know, Satan, again, was never evil just for the sake of being evil. Iniquity was found in him. He wanted to ascend, you know, above the stars. He wanted to sit on the throne. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted to be God. That was what he thought was good. This is gonna be good for me. I'm gonna, no, it's evil. You may think it's good for you, but it's not because it goes against the will of God. So our battle needs to be fought with this understanding of what evil is and what they are trying to attain to. You look at all the global elites and what they are trying to do, and they laugh at our demise. They laugh at the pain and suffering and the killing that they're doing. Why? Well, it's evil, but they see it as good. This is for me. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to attain to. And I don't care how I get it, who I stomp over, who I have to kill or enslave to do it. You know, who I have to defy, which is God. So when it comes to the tertium quid, everything is good. And if there is a dualistic nature of what someone thinks is dark and what someone thinks is life, it is on a substandard level.
it's not God versus Satan, but God's up here, and it's more, say, St. Michael versus Satan. It's the angelic versus the demonic. And then you go even to a sub more substandard level, and here we are, a little bit lower than the angels with humans, and we got a whole array of gray. What's good? What's bad? Where's where's the white lies? Where's you know the the doing bad things to have good outcomes? There's just a whole jigsaw puzzle of different things, and we need to focus on what God wants us to do and what He's calling us to do. And when we learn to focus in on what God is calling us to do and what he has ordained for us and the powers he has given to us and what we are supposed to do, that is being in alignment and in agreement with his goodness, his will, and his plan. And you stop the demonic activity by proclaiming this, by declaring and decreeing that they have no power over you, that they have no hold over anything that you do, that you believe in what God is ordaining for your life, regardless of what that may be. And this is how we fight our spiritual battles, uh, how we fight the spiritual warfare, how we know who we are in God, as, as I was saying in the previous episode of us being kings and priests, how we need to decree and declare stuff, how we need to um, hold in agreement to what God is saying or proclaiming into our lives. We don't decree and declare because of what we want. We do it because we are in agreement with what he wants. And this is where our action of being partakers in this battle falls into place. We just don't stand around and wait for God to act. We just don't, oh, I'll just say a prayer and hope this happens. No, he wants us to be soldiers. He wants us to fight in the spiritual battle. And we need to do it uh, in the right manner, with the right tools, and with the right, I guess, mindset. Because when I originally did it, I feel that I did it wrong. And I, I may have won, you know, the particular battle but I, I didn't win the war against them I didn't save the person's soul I, I had a different mindset and we need to be aware that when we go into the spiritual battle when we need to intercess because there's different types it's not just demonic possession you, you can intercede like cat care does with the weather system and all this bad stuff that's coming you know like uh, actions against Hawaii and volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and stuff like that they intercede against the principalities and powers and domains within that realm who are causing these things because it's not just human it's also demonic as well too they try and intercess and pray spiritual warfare against these battles and try and stop them there's different callings that each person has when it comes to spiritual warfare my question is which one uh, do you feel your calling is in and um, I'd say just start taking action and do it um, there's much we can do but we need to stay focused we need to be in prayer constantly especially for the days ahead of what is coming we need to be prepped and ready for what is going down and I know even for myself my whole aspect of what I just explained of what I, I was hoping spiritual warfare would be but it's really not it's not like I'm gonna go off on a you know a vampire slaying expedition um, but uh, our, our, our battle is spiritual in nature and I think that's where we need to look and where we need to fight and let God expose the ones here in this realm because once we push back the enemy in the spiritual they won't have their shields anymore down here to use like all all the power that they were getting from them is going to be gone and they will be left pretty much holding the bag kind of sitting there staring blankly into the cameras as we start asking questions of what's going down they won't have a defense they won't have that enemy there to give them the information that they need and then from there we can let god and hopefully the military with their tribunals kick in and get this done and over with so I hope that's helped a little bit. I know I'm going probably way overboard to what I originally <laughs> had intended. It's a long one, and I know that there is much, much more that I wanted to say, and hopefully maybe I'll be able to fill up a little bit more in the next episode with the two presidents, because it kind of ties in. We've gone into the spiritual warfare of who we are fighting in the spirit, obviously principalities and powers, um, demonic entities and stuff, and the ones that are trying to control the global elite. Now we looked at the global elite in reality, you know, and we try and oppose them and stand up against them, but we need to fight off the spiritual nature first so that these people can be exposed. And we just keep declaring and decreeing exposure as well, too. We keep telling, you know, uh, agreeing with God that this is what we need to do. Um, and I think the more we do that, the faster it'll come. Now, next episode is going to be called The Two Presidents, and it's more about the the human side of this spiritual battle 
and what is going down and just certain things that you can be aware of that are starting to come actually being exposed to light i think within this last month or so there's been so much exposure coming out i think the tables have been turning and things are going to be going more into our favor but the more that they do the more the elites are going to ramp up their agenda their plan to take us all out and that's what it means by the days are going to get darker because they're going to be painted into a corner with no other option but to hit the nuke button and i think there's going to be i mean when i said that hit the nuke button i i i you know that may be a literal thing so we need to be prepared for what's going to be happening but god said none of it's going to come to fruition i wouldn't be surprised they do set off nuclear weapons and everything comes down and before they explode they just land all duds i mean could be that too you know i'm not putting anything past both the global elites and what the lord has planned in this time so i'm keeping my eyes open to everything so again i hope this helped and i hope you can get prepped up for the spiritual battle which is coming and your own calling to what god is trying to put you into and i pray health and prosperity to all of you who are in this and who are fighting for this and to hopefully be part of the last harvest when they all come flocking in uh, you'll have a fair share to reap <laughs> on, <clears throat> on bringing souls into christ so heavenly father thank you for this time and thank you for this talk i had um i feel that i've extended it but also so much so much more that i wanted to say maybe i should make this a a part two as maybe my last episode in this series because it feels like i i felt like i didn't have enough um time to go into all the things which i wanted to express in spiritual warfare which i've done throughout because there's there's been so much of it especially in that of dreams and visions that i've had and if anyone else has dreams and visions i pray that they share them on here if they had any demonic activity or possession and oppression that they put it on here for others to see and be be prepped and um have faith in the lord that he will come through with the spiritual warfare that we are going through in these days I bless all of you and Holy Spirit come into all these people to give them discernment and give them consultation, give them comfort during this time and let them know that the calling has, uh, the calling of the Father has upon their life. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. And again, I started this a little later today because of just all the craziness that's been going down. Uh, the girls are gone now. We finally kicked them out of the house so I can have some quiet. I'm sorry if it gets too choppy in this video because it's been just wild. A um, lot of a lot of kind of interruptions that I've been having today. So I'm sorry if it is a little choppy and the segments are a little off. But um, oh, two more things. Uh, I would recommend. Uh, going a little bit different on the prophetic people to listen to and i'm going to mention again as previously mark driscoll with his series called new days old demons and this goes into the topic of uh demonic warfare and what we're entering into these days and explains quite fully even from just a visual uh, visible um can't talk today man visible uh like reality of everything that's happening with antifa and the government and it's just you see the demonic entities behind these particular uh sex and government administrations and just all that's happening with the lgbt extended name and stuff uh blm it's it's pretty crazy uh, i would definitely recommend checking it out it may be a good eye opener for you and the last book that i would recommend it's kind of two books uh, this has caused so much controversy. Rebecca Brown, MD, they, uh, he came to set the captives free, which is the main book I would recommend, but I would also recommend Prepare for War. I don't even know where to begin with those books. I've, I've read them and I agree with them, but there's a lot of Christians who don't agree with them. There's been a lot of, uh, flack and like, um, discrediting upon Rebecca Brown saying all the stuff that she did there's there's been no proof about her saving a uh say satanist like queen in a sense a high priestess and brought her to christ there's it shows you how demonic activity works with stuff like levitation and and magic and, and things like that um how there is such things as you know vampires and werewolves and um 
just a, a whole slew of different spiritual warfare. And I've went through and I've watched some videos even today about the discrediting of her and a good portion of people that are commenting on that were saying they were saved by Rebecca Brell. They've done spiritual warfare because of Rebecca Brell. They've, they've brought, uh, themselves into a new light because of these books and then there's also a giant discrediting from the church um that's saying she's a fraud she's she's a fake she took drugs to write this book and i'm not sure what to believe because um rebecca brown passed away and she can't really stand up for herself anymore you know take credit or say yeah this this is a hoax or no this is a real deal and it's really hard to tell because there are many within the church that aren't of the church and they're trying to discredit certain people, especially when it comes to spiritual warfare. So what I would do is I would question every spirit. I would use a discerning heart. If you're going to read these books, read them and then decide for yourself. Like, is this a legit book? Is this good spiritual warfare? Is this good sound doctrine on how to fight the demons, you know, or is it, is it all just a hoax? Um, definitely get into the spirit with that one and ask God. I, it's, it's almost something I would encourage you to read, even if it was fake, even if it is turning out to be a fraud, I would read those books just so that you can get the discernment within you so that you can understand where the enemy is trying to come in and either twist the truth, or if she is right, where the enemy is coming in to try and discredit the truth and use that spiritual warfare against them. So it's, it's a good, I'd say it's a very good controversial book. Um, because to this day, it's so split. It's so split on her book. People, there's half the church is saying yay and half the church is saying nay. And it's just like, wow, which, which is right. And you need to follow your discernment. Um, and again, just like any book, like any person, uh, pick out the pieces that you know can be used in the spirit for fighting. And there's people like Ron Wyatt, uh, who discovered a whole bunch of places like the real Mount Sinai and the Red Sea crossing and Noah's Ark. Um, he gets discredited. Half the people believe him. The other half people don't. There's people like, um, Kent Hovind. There's people like Chuck Missler. There's, there's many people that I listen to that I believe who are of God and they, and they found these things. And a lot of the church and scientific community discredits them on a whole bunch of stuff. So very controversial. Um, those are usually the places to go to the best, to get the best nuggets and see exactly what is going down and how to best perceive things in the spirit and use your discernment. So I would highly recommend those books. Uh, I guess that's it for now. And I hope this helped and may God bless you and heal you and give you guidance during this time. Stay in the spirit, armor up. It's going to get fun. So until then, take care and God bless. Okay.